private game reserve is 23,000 hectares of pristine South African wilderness. Here, it's common to see the country's most iconic animals up close. Yet researcher Tristan Dickerson spends most of his time searching, not seeing. These tracks here, no doubt a male. Um, you can see he's been walking up and down the road here, so obviously something's interested him in this area. So I can see it's a, a male leopard track because of, due to its size, it's a much bigger track than the female. What I do is I just measure my palm and my hand against the track. The male leopard will take me up to uh, this knuckle over here from the base of my palm. A female leopard track will fit inside my palm. He crosses the reserve armed with time-tested tracking skills paired with the latest technology. Yeah, so we've got an infrared triggered camera trap here. Um, if anything warm bodied walks in front of it, it will take a photograph of them. And this is the way, or well, this is the method we use to count leopards, the most accurate method that we know. And leopards, uh, spot patterns and rosettes are unique between individuals, just like our fingerprints, so we can identify them through that process. His subject is the elusive leopard. So, for Dickerson, it means days without even a glimpse of the big cat. I don't think it's going to work from the top. He's no doubt watching us. This is most of, we spend our life being watched by leopards and never seen them. But he'll have his eyes fixed on us and slowly, by now he's probably lying flat again, just sleeping. Um, but because they're so camouflaged, we just can't see them. Let's just let him settle down a bit. Another 40 minutes, it will start getting a bit darker. Tonight, he's trying to locate one of the reserve's males with the help of its radio collar. We put these radio collars onto leopards so that uh, we can get the best information in the shortest period of time. For nearly a decade, he's been tagging and tracking leopards in this manner. With radio collaring, even without seeing the leopard, Dickerson is still able to study its movements. We've now studied 74 different individuals, following them on a daily basis to look at their ranging patterns and the effects of persecution on this population. So it is it's the most intensive study on leopards done in the world. For the company that runs Pinda, having a healthy leopard population is crucial to the reserve's success. But from a tourism point of view, they're incredibly elusive. They're solitary animals. Um, They've got an aura about them that's completely unique of all the cats because they're so difficult to find, being completely nocturnal. Um, and you add all of the, the different attributes that leopards have, and that's what makes them so desirable from a photographic uh, tourism. The delight in the guest's face when they actually find it is significant, and it, it really it, it becomes a life-changing experience for guests. But the leopard's movements and the reserve's location created a challenge to the pox population you can only contain certain species. Things like leopard actually belong to the region. They don't belong to any individual landowner. This is something that a leopard would use to get out. This hole would have been dug by a hyena or warthogs in the area and then the leopards will use it. Leopards need a lot less than this to move through fences. They can move through little gaps under the fences like we can see here or they can jump over. So the bottom line is that fences don't contain leopards. You've got to manage your neighbours. Yeah, exactly. So it's important to, to know what your neighbours are up to as far as leopards go. You might be trying to conserve leopards and have ecotourism where your neighbours are hunting them or, or having cattle farms where they've been destroyed. What is the situation here? Who are your neighbours and, and, and how are you guys working together? So in the case of Pinda, we've got state-run reserves as a, as a neighbour. We've got cattle farms, we've got hunting farms and we've got com communities which is, makes it incredibly complex to manage, but this is why we're here studying the leopards in this environment, because it's this complexity and high persecution rates, so we can see what changes are occurring within Pinda's population. What Dickerson and his team of researchers found were leopards that traveled not just outside of Pinda's fences, but also beyond South Africa's borders. One leopard moved through three different countries. Um, we are at the junction of three different countries, so um, just to put that in context, but still it's significant when these things are moving hundreds of kilometres, um, and that was completely flabbergasting for me. More importantly, they proved exactly where leopards were most heavily targeted. Um, what we noticed is that there was high impact areas, in other words, hotspots where 
leopards were being persecuted at much higher levels than other areas. And where was that? And these were specifically right next door to Pinda, by chance. So the areas around Pinda was taken about 90% of the leopard hunting was going to the areas immediately around Pinda, which made Pinda the perfect place to study this. By spreading hunting permits throughout the entire province, researchers saw the amount of leopards per 100 square kilometers increase from seven leopards in 2005 to 11 in 2009. People make changes then leave assuming everything will be fine, but we continue to monitor their population to see what positive or, or negative impacts this conservation interventions could have. Back in the bush, Dickerson and his team zero in on the young male they've been tracking for hours. Have a look now, you can see his eyes shining. It's dark now and the big cat is more relaxed, allowing the researchers to finally catch a glimpse. Okay, so we've got him, he's just lying in the long grass there now. See how he's moving his head around a lot? He's going to start moving, I'm sure. This is a normal sighting for us, you know, to just see a few spots, some eyes. Um, especially in high persecuted areas like this, you've got to build trust with these animals and um, that just takes time. Tomorrow, Dickerson will need more than just a glimpse. He'll attempt to capture and recolor Menzi, Pinder's dominant and very large male, a necessary but potentially dangerous task. Okay.